Welcome, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, bonjour tout. And uh, on behalf of myself and Mark Flap, uh, we appreciate the fact that you're giving uh, your time to attend this AV over IP uh, basics and Mox Lab product line uh, review. My name is uh, Jose Mosota. I'm the president of Premon Solutions. I'm a consultant that focuses exclusively on uh, AV training. I hold a CTS and CTSI certification from Avixa. Uh, I'm also an HD based T authorized trainer, Dante certified level three, and an SDBOE certified design uh, partner. And AV over IP is really my most uh, interesting subject. I'm really in love with AV over IP. So, the goal of the class is uh, to actually learn the basics of AV as it relates to IP transport and to review the IT concepts that are relevant to the management and transport of digital AV signals. Uh, I just want to uh, let you know this is going to be a race against time. Uh, we only have one hour. And we have to make sure that we mention all the items, both on the AV side and on the IT side, that are relevant to AV over IP. Uh, so I'm going to be skimming the surface on all those items and just uh, planting seeds in your brain for you to go out and look more in depth about them. Uh, we're also planning with MoxLab a further session later on, a three, three and a half hour session, where we will actually have time to go into each one of the items in detail. But this should be more like an, a moose bush for you in terms of material. So the goal is then to provide you with the tools uh, to make an educated decision when you're looking at the design and implementation of an AB over IP system. And at the end, we're going to review how Mox Lab can help you with their AB over IP solutions. And please participate. Uh, any questions you have, put them in the chat. They will be relayed to me. Uh, most likely, we're going to answer them at the end of the webinar. And if we don't have time, then we'll do it uh, via email. Uh, but all your questions will be answered. Uh, our agenda is going to go this way. First, why do we even want to talk about AV over IP? Uh, once we agree that it's a great idea, uh, we're going to look at what all the digital audiovisual signal concepts that are relevant to the transport over IP. And we're going to look at what are the IT concepts that are relevant in networking for the transport of AV. Uh, we're going to reach the conclusion that we need compression in order to make the signal fit into a network, and we're going to look at compression. Uh, we're also going to get to the conclusion that uh, you cannot transport an AV signal with regular TCP IP protocols uh, because the AV signal we're going to see is pretty special. So we're going to look at the protocols that are used for AV transport. And then we're going to look at what are your IP requirements more in terms of the switches. Uh, then uh, we're going to spend a few minutes uh, talking about the conversation that needs to happen between AB and IT whenever a project is going to be made. Uh, this is a team effort. AB cannot do it without IT, and IT cannot help without the help of AB. Uh, we're just going to mention the word security because every time we talk about IT, we have to mention the word security. Uh, then we're going to look at the AB over IP triangle and some typical solutions or implementations of AB over IP. And finally, uh, we're going to quickly review the MoxLab AB over IP uh, solutions. Uh, if you're going to work on AB over IP, if you're going to deploy AB over IP solutions, there are certain industry alliance and associations that you should be aware of and that you should actually be going to their side. You should register. You should get correspondence from them. You should be monitoring what they are doing uh, because they are the ones that are doing things relevant to uh, our work in AB over IP. Uh, the SDBOE Alliance and their 10 gig solution, uh, AFNU and their uh, audio video breaching solution, uh, SEMTI, uh, more on the broadcast side, Society of Motion Picture and Television Engineers, but bridging now into ProAV with AINS, the Alliance for IP Media Solution. Obviously, Avixa as the association that brings everything that it's uh, AB together. Uh, Big C for the structured cabling portion that becomes important when you're working in networking. Uh, the Audio Engineering Society for their uh, AES67 uh, standard. And finally, something fairly new, the uh, SRT Alliance that is developing a special protocol to transmit AV signals over what they call dirty networks. So these things should be things uh, that you're familiar with. And I'm going to start with a little bit of controversy uh, because especially my group of uh, AV people on Twitter, we argue a lot about this. And I just want to state my position from the beginning. AV is not IT and IT is not AV. 
Essentially, TCP IP is a transport method for an AV signal. It's a sophisticated one. It's a complex one. It offers you options that the old point-to-point -point doesn't. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, it's the same thing that if you're using an HDMI cable from a source to a display that is five meters away directly, you are transporting an AV signal and you want to transport that AV signal to certain places and AV over IP allows you to do that. So from that point of view, I consider uh, TCP IP as a transport method for an AV signal. So why do we even want to talk about AV over IP? Well, our traditional AV transport methods were all point to point. And essentially we have no standards, as you know, uh, each solution has a name, like Crestron, Extron, Crimp, whatever. Whoever makes a solution, they put a name on them in most cases, and they tend not to play well with other solutions. Uh, so we had our sources, uh, we had connectors, and we could go point to point to this place, uh, three to 15 meters with uh, regular cables. Then we developed the active optical cables and the active copper cables that allowed us to go about 100 meters, but we were still going point to point. And if we had many sources, or if we had many displays, then we needed to get these huge matrix switchers, uh, 16 by 16, 32 by 32, 128, 128, uh, pretty unwieldy, pretty large, and in some cases, uh, pretty wasteful because you didn't have enough sources, you didn't have, um, you actually had more display than sources, and you were not using all the capabilities of the matrix switcher. Uh, then, in 2010, uh, a new player came into town, a uh, smart player, HD based T, that be, took over uh, the AV world by storm, and probably nowadays more than half of the installations are actually done with HD based T. And uh, what they said is, well, why don't we use the same cable that they use for Ethernet, so the uh, twisted pair, four twisted pair cable, and instead of sending Ethernet packages, uh, we're going to create a box that will create our own HD based T packages. They call them T packages. And this way, we're going to be able to send the signal uh, 100 meters, uh, which gives us a pretty good distance like we have on Ethernet uh, to a display. Uh, and because of the way we're going to create the packets, uh, we're also going to be able to put in their control sources. We're going to put RS-232, we're going to put infrared, we're actually going to add USB transport, we're going to add Ethernet transport going in both directions. And since we have PoE, we're going to do POH and we're going to put 100 watts of power on the cable. And that was a beautiful solution. Uh, and really, uh, a lot of manufacturers, or every manufacturer, went ahead with it. Uh, all of them added bells and whistles to the boxes, etc., to make them more attractive. But it's been ruling the AV world now for uh, quite a while. However, if you wanted to do more sources to more displays, you also needed the matrix switcher, because you were still going with the famous point to point. So what was going on on the world of networking? Well, on the world of networking, we had standards. Uh, we only work with standards on the world of uh, IP, on the world of networking. Those standards guarantee that products will be compatible and interoperable. Uh, we have been running now networks for many, many, many years. And the networks have been continuously being upgraded in terms of bandwidth and performance. Uh, today, uh, 1 gig and 10 gig are common in the enterprise. Uh, 40 gig, 100 gig, and now 400 gig, which is already commercially available uh, by Fiverr, are available in data centers. Uh, 20 gig and 40 gig are also available in copper uh, category A cabling and connectors in a data center, about essentially for very short runs from rack to rack. So we have these different cabling options, copper and fiber, that allow us enhanced bandwidth and distances depending uh, which one we want to use. And we have a very special piece of equipment called the switch that is very smart. And when you send stuff into it, it knows how to send it, where to send it, in which order to send it, to give it priority, etc. And if you help it with a router, uh, then you can go anywhere you want. And it also gives you the famous one to many options, the multicast that we in AV had always been wishing that we could do it one source to many displays. And also at the same time, 10 gig has been coming down in price and it coincides with the arrival of 4K and 8K resolutions. So 
you know, if you actually need to do a 10 gig network for your particular application, now it's very convenient. It's not that expensive. So uh, what do we have then in the world of AV over IP? Uh, this is schematic here. You can make it as complicated as you want. You can add as many bells and whistles as you want, but this is what it is. Uh, you take a signal, an AV signal, and also you can put control sources, of course, and you put it into a box, an encoder. And that encoder does two things. Uh, be very clear about it. It does two things that are completely separate. The first thing that it does, it compresses the signal. And we're going to discuss why we need compression. And after compressing the signal, then it's like a NIC card. It creates the packets, the frames, the segments that are going to be put into the network, okay, to transport it to wherever we want to transport it through the switch, could be a one gig switch or a 10 gig switch. Then on the other side, uh, it's going to go into another box, uh, the decoder, that uh, it is going to turn that signal into an HDMI signal or a display port, depending on the output that you want, that you want to show on a display. And by the way, the decoder uh, does not decompress uh, because what you compress and throw away, you lose. So the decoder just takes the signal that comes as packages, IT packages, and assembles back an AV signal that a display can understand. Uh, the boxes we're going to learn also in this presentation can be uh, heavy compression. So if you want to put the signal on a one gig network, you have to heavily compress it. And that's called lossy. And uh, if you want to put it on a 10 gig network, you can get away with light compression and we're going to call it visually lossless. And the rule to put in your head, in your brain forever is that you need one encoder per source, only one encoder for each source that you want to put on your network. And you need one receiver per display, one decoder per display. Uh, if you have a video wall, for example, it depends on the appliance that you're using to show the video wall. You may end up with, uh, let's say for nine screens, nine receivers, and you control each one of the screens, or you may end up with an appliance that can take the signals and create the scenes for you with only one box that it's a little bit more complex than the nine uh, individual receivers. But at the end of the day is one transmitter per source, one receiver per display or video wall. And, and why do we want to do these things? Well, AV over IP is extremely flexible and expandable. Uh, it grows on a port by port basis, so we can add things, we can add sources and connect it as long as we have ports all left over. Uh, we can connect displays and keep on connecting. Uh, the size of the system is just limited by the bandwidth. Uh, the moment you start putting streams in there, uh, they keep adding up in bandwidth, and if you run out of bandwidth, then you cannot transmit them anymore. But we're going to learn uh, that you can get very, very, very low bandwidth streams with a pretty good quality of picture, and that allows you to put a lot of stuff into a network. Uh, it does support virtual architectural rearrangements, so that's great. If you want to display something different in a display, uh, a different source, you don't have to go there and change a cable. Uh, you just sit at a control uh, PC and you can do all your control from there. So it's virtual architectural rearrangement. Uh, it does allow you point to point, like we said, uh, for typical AV, but it also allows you point to multi point, which is multicast or multi point to multi point. So essentially, you are not limited anymore uh, to what you can do. You can do whatever you want. Uh, it's convenient and cost effective. It can use existing infrastructure. That's an interesting discussion in itself for which we don't have time today. Uh, but you could find production networks that uh, uh, would allow you to put signals in there as long as they are very low uh, bandwidth and uh, the content is not proprietary, etc. So you could coexist on an existing infrastructure. Uh, and if not, you can still VLAN your uh, network and still be on a regular uh, network. Uh, typically, uh, you will use gigabit networks and 10 gigs are coming down on price. And please don't listen to both sides of the story. The people that sell only one gig will tell you that 10 gig is very difficult. Uh, the people that only sell 10 gig will tell you that one gig doesn't work. That's not true. One gig works, 10 gig works. Both of them are used on the enterprise for many, many, many years. I used to work at Ortronics and in 2005, we were selling 10 gig connectors and that's more than 16 years ago. So uh, from that point of view, uh, it's all about the application. Uh, it centrally managed and you can access the content from anywhere. And the centrally managed, the virtual architecture rearrangement are such powerful arguments. Uh, for example, uh, you, some of you are going to be in uh, Quebec, so La Cache of Oils, uh, the famous sports bar over there uh, has AB over IP 
uh, uh, systems, and there is one guy sitting in a room in downtown Montreal that is running the whole show. So if they want to change the beer that they are showing at the bottom of the biggest screen, he does it. If there's a problem with a screen, he fixes it. If they want to change the channel they're showing, he does it. So this centrally managed uh, virtual architectural rearrangement is extremely, extremely powerful. Okay, so what we're going to do for the rest of the presentation is we're going to go through this uh, flow chart. Uh, we're going to take a digital signal and we're going to learn which video concepts are important to AV over IP. Uh, we're going to talk about what is color compression uh, because we have to know from a subsampling to talk AV over IP. That's what you see published out there 444, 420, 421. Well, today, if you don't, you're going to know what it is. Then we're going to code it with compression codecs to transport it with networking protocols. And then we're going to decode it and show it on the screen. So the first thing is when we want to show a video, for example, a video is only a collection of images. So we have to send image by image at a certain frame rate. And what we're sending to the receiver, to the display, to create the image are the pixels. We need to send information on the pixels of the image. And the number of pixels depends on the resolution. So in a few words, the more resolution, the more pixels, the more bandwidth. So uh, high definition, uh, 1080 by 1920, it's about 2 million pixels. Uh, ultra high definition, uh, 2160 by 3840, it's about 8 million pixels. And now talking, people are talking about 8K is 4320 by 7760, and that's 33 uh, million uh, pixels. And by the way, in case you don't know it, you may wonder, why do we have ultra high definition TV on, on, instead of just calling it uh, 4K? Well, the actual real 4K is 4096 by 2160, and that gives you an aspect ratio of 17 to 9. And it means that all the manufacturers of these plays would have had to change their uh, production line because their lines are set up for 16 to 9, and they didn't want to do that. So people got together and created ultra high definition TV 4K 3840 2160. It preserves the 16 to 9 aspect ratio of televisions, and you're not really losing too much. Uh, in the movies, in the theaters, they kept the 17 to 9, that's called Digital Cinema Initiative. And as you can see, uh, compared to an HK uh, screen, uh, HDTV, high definition is very small, even 4K is very small. So every time you go from one to the other, uh, you need upscaling, and that's another topic for our in-depth seminar, be aware of upscaling. So once I send the pixels, I also send, I need to send information as to what is the color of each pixel. Uh, because that's the way that we're going to get the image. And for that, we use the uh, bits per color. Uh, typically, in high definition, we used to use 8 bits. Uh, with 4K, we're using 10. In some cases, 12 and 16 for special applications, military, hospitals, etc. cetera. And, and that gives you millions and millions of colors. And some people ask me once, well, uh, if the human eye can only see about 10 million colors, uh, which is totally covered with 8 bits per color. Why do I want to put 10 bits per color? Why do I need 1.1 billion colors? Well, uh, the UK has the answer for you. They created a place where artificial intelligence looks at medical images. So when you look at a medical image, uh, the doctor itself may not be able to detect slight variations of gray or white and white where the illness is, but an artificial intelligence that actually reads the uh, bytes and the bits and the content of those particular pixels can determine where the problem starts, and, and that's extremely helpful. So having more bits per color uh, may not help your eyes, but it will certainly help uh, the application uh, in many cases. Uh, so essentially, when you have more bits per color and you're watching a video, uh, you normally don't see banding. Uh, in some cases of videos with a lot of motion against the sky, you actually see banding on your TV. If you have more bits per color, you don't see banding. And the other thing, you can go from this little triangle, which is Rec 709, which is the uh, uh, colors that we can cover with 8 bits color in the today uh, systems. You can go to the Rec 2020, which is the new uh, sort of color spectrum, all the colors that we can cover uh, with the new uh, system. So we're increasing also the shades of color that we are uh, looking at. Uh, another important thing that we have to transmit, we have to transmit the uh, uh, HDR. Uh, high dynamic range information. 
And as you know, high dynamic range is the difference between dynamic range is the difference between the lightest and the darkest uh, picture on a, or, or areas in a picture uh, on a standard definition that we uh, used to have before for high definition standard dynamic range. Uh, we actually had a possibility to show very, very little compared to what the eye can see uh, with 8 bit color. Uh, with 10 bit color minimum, uh, we can show today on the screens uh, HDR uh, solutions that actually resemble almost the same thing that the human eye can see. So that makes that the picture, uh, it's actually better because you can see the dark areas, even though you have also light areas in the same picture, and both of them are showing the uh, resolution. Okay, so those these are the characteristics of the digital video signal. What I'm sending, I'm sending pixels, I'm sending color, uh, I'm sending uh, HDR information. And then also we need to learn and understand what is chroma subsample. So uh, from day one, uh, when people started working with digital signals, they realized that digital signals uh, have a lot of information. They're very heavy, they have a lot of bandwidth. They occupy a lot of space when you save them. So at the production level, uh, when we do something, we call it 444. And essentially, uh, we tend to use the color space YCVCR, where we use one channel for luminance or uh, contrast and two channels for colors, set di uh, differences between blue, red, and green. And if we don't touch anything, if we actually store the image like it was produced, if we transmit the image like it was produced, uh, then it's called 444. And let me tell you, it's beautiful. If you ever had a chance to see one, if you go to a show, sometimes uh, different manufacturers will have a real 444 image connected with an HDMI cable uh, of one meter only to a small screen, and they will show you a 444 image, and you're going to be impressed because it almost looks like it is uh, uh, three-dimensional. Uh, but they also went in and they said, well, can we reduce that bandwidth? Can we make the image smaller in bandwidth? Can we throw away stuff that people are not going to care about? So the scientists went in and they found out you cannot touch the, the luma, okay? So the uh, contrast, your eyes are extremely sensitive to contrast. So they kept that four, always four. But they found out that you can throw away a lot of the color and nobody notices. And this is about having people in a room and asking them, can you see the difference? And people saying, no, I cannot. Okay, so then the image goes. And the most popular chroma subsampling out there, it's a 420 uh, chroma subsampling that reduces 50% the bandwidth of any signal. And you use it every day. Uh, any DVD Blu-ray uh, has 420. Uh, it comes 420 to your home. And actually your TV or your Blu-ray player is gonna upscale it to 444 in order to fill the information in all the pixels on the TV. But 420 is widely used, 411 is used for mobile news. Uh, 422 used to be used in the little digital video recordings to feed the, the file into a little uh, card that you had with the video recorder. But essentially, most images that you're going to have nowadays are going to be 420. And you're going to see a lot of spec sheets from products telling you, I can handle 4K60444, or I can handle 4K60420 upscale to 444. And when you see that 444420, what it means is, is the chroma subsampling, is the image pristine, or have we thrown away some of the color information? Never, ever the contrast information. So this point is how are you going to calculate the bandwidth of a digital signal? Uh, well, you take the number of pixels you're going to transmit, you take the frame rate, how many frames you're going to send per second, you take the color bit depth, how many bits per each color, uh, you multiply by three because that's the number of graphic channels, RGB or YCVCR, and you reduce the bandwidth uh, if you use chroma subsampling. So if you use 444, you don't touch it. If you use 420, you multiply it by 0 0.5. And just to give you an idea, for a 4K uh, 60 8 bit color 444, you would have 3840 by 2160 uh, times 60 times 8 times three, times one, and that gives you 12 gigabits per second. So that signal doesn't even fit on a 10 gig network. We need compression. And this chart, which would be available in the PDF that uh, MockLab will make available to you, uh, probably is the most important chart that you're gonna be using afterwards in your day-to-day -day work. Uh, what I have done here is I plotted the bandwidth of signals, uh, high definition, 8-bit color 30, uh, 4K 830, 4K 1030, uh, 4K 860. So all the possible combinations of resolution, bits per color, and frame rate. And as you can see, 
uh, I use a 420. So any, each one of these needs to be multiplied by two if we want 444. Uh, this is a 10 gig network, and even a 10 gig network will not be able to handle all kinds of signals. Uh, this is a one gig network. Uh, but look why point to point will survive. All to point will survive because HDMI uh, 2.0 actually has, I'm sorry, HDMI 2.0 has a bandwidth of about 18 gigabits per second. So it is much more powerful than any network. And HDMI 2.1 uh, it's going to go to 47.8 gigabits per second, so or 48 gigabits per second. So you know, uh, with an HDMI point to point, you'll be able to handle an 8K 1660 uh, without any problem. However, if you want to get out of the room, if you want to send it multi point, if you want to multicast, then you cannot do it, and that's where you're going to need to compress uh, the signal. And if there are any purists in the t in the room right now that are looking at the numbers and saying, "Wait a second, I'm used to other numbers for bandwidth for HDMI." Any HDMI transmission will add 20, 25% bandwidth because there are two extra bits for the TMDS, Transition Minimized Differential Signal uh, Transport. So add that if you want to have the value for uh, HDMI. And by the way, if you're wondering what adds uh, bits to the transportation and to the signal, it's not the frame rate, it's not the HDR, it's not the color, it's the resolution. So if we go now to AK, the resolution is the one that makes your life uh, difficult. Uh, just very quickly, if you're doing audio, you don't have to worry about anything uh, because audio has an extremely low bandwidth. Uh, you can check this table in more detail on the PDF, but even a DVD audio, uh, 192 kilohertz uh, sampling rate, which is ridiculous. Only an audio file would be able to see the difference there. Uh, 24 bits per sample, an incredible amount of detail. Uh, six channels on the DVD audio for your uh, home theater. Uh, it will give you 27 megabits, so that's really tiny. That's why most audio signals are not even compressed. Uh, they are only compressed when we want to store them, when you want to put 3,000 songs on an iPod, on an iPhone, then you compress them so that they can take less uh, space. Good. So that's what we need to know about the uh, digital signal. Now, what do we need to know about IT? These are the things you need to go about IT, uh, know about IT pretty quickly. Uh, on the LAN, uh, you are the king of the hill. Uh, your LAN has known capacity, very low packet loss, very low latency. You control everything. The moment you get out of your LAN and go into the uh, wide area network or the internet, uh, you don't know the capacity. Uh, you're going to have packet loss. Uh, you're going to have cheater and you're going to have high latency. So you go from being king in the hill to being the lowliest peasant in the LAN. So, you know, you want to make your life easy, keep everything on the LAN. And do you want to go to the one? Go to the one, but make sure that uh, you understand what's going on. Make sure that you use a content delivery network. We'll talk about streaming. But going on the LAN, make sure also that you go with signals that are very low on bandwidth in order to make your life uh, easier. Uh, Ethernet speeds, we already mentioned them. Uh, they are now working at the 1.6, 800 gigabit standard. So in the future, we're going to have more bandwidth that we will ever need for uh, anything. Uh, the important uh, thing to know about uh, IT is the OSI model. So to know how a signal uh, or information mo moves through the network, uh, you enter a request on an application layer, which may be your browser, and that creates a little packet that gets sent to the presentation layer to be actually encoded, encrypted, presented, et cetera, uh, to the rest of the network in a language that the networks can understand. The session layer creates the connection between the two devices that are going to speak. Uh, the transport layer makes sure that the information goes from A to B uh, according to the way that you want it to go. Uh, then the network layer deals with IP addresses and finds out where people live is the postal service of the internet. Uh, once you get to the data link layer, it's like the mailbox in the building. We're already in the building. Now we just need to find the apartment. And the physical layer is where we actually uh, put the information on the wire. And each one of these layers is adding a little uh, header and that is called encapsulation. Uh, a frame uh, on Ethernet normally has about 1,500 bytes of data, but there is a concept you need to know if you were with AB, which is the concept of jumbo frame. Uh, jumbo frames actually can take 9,000 uh, bytes of data, so you need less frames to send the information that you need with a regular frame. And JPEG 2000 can use jumbo frames. However, that can be a problem if you're trying to go outside your LAN uh, because there are routers that don't accept jumbo frames. 
And when you go outside your land, uh, not into your own one, but into the public internet, uh, you don't know which router your signal is going to go through. So sending a signal out with JPEG 2000 and jumbo frames uh, could create an issue because a router that doesn't understand that is going to throw away uh, the frame. Uh, IP addresses, uh, very important. Uh, you can do static addressing and that's good, but avoid it if you can, because everybody can make mistakes doing static addressing. And if you give the same address to two things, you're gonna have a mess. Uh, DHCP is beautiful. I uh, give you the address automatically. However, for AB, there's a little problem. Uh, if the server is rebooted, if there is an issue when the lease is renewed, you may end up getting a different IP that you had before. And uh, a lot of your systems actually track the sources to the displays using IP addresses. And that's how you configure all your control software. So if the IP address of any of those component changes, you have a problem. That's why we recommend that for AB, uh, you talk to IT to get DHCP with reservations. And from that point of view, it will take a small area of the DHCP and it will assign always the same address to a given MAC address. And in that way, the uh, address of that projector will never change no matter what happens to the uh, DHCP uh, server. Uh, transfer protocols, there are two of them uh, because the AB transfer protocols happen in the higher layers, TCP and UDP. Uh, TCP is like the uh, uh, well-behaved person that asks for permission. Are you ready to receive? Yes, I am. Can I send you three frames? Yes, you can send me three segments. Can I send you four? Yes, did you receive them? Uh, a lot of talk, a lot of conversation. That means a lot of overhead, a lot of latency. Doesn't work for AB. Uh, UDP is not polite. The receiver says, I want the signal. Here it goes, boom, I'm sending it to you. You get it fine. You don't get it. It's your problem. Uh, but that's what we use for AB. Uh, so does that mean we don't care about packet loss? Well, it's not that critical. Think about it. Uh, if I'm sending an image uh, from an iPhone that has 3.5 megabytes of uh, uh, data on it, because that's how many, uh, the size of the file, uh, and a frame has 1,500 bytes, uh, I need 2,333 frames to actually send the image. So on a regular network with a one to 2% packet loss, uh, if I lose 23 packet, packets that are randomly lost, and maybe I lost color information in one pixel, maybe I, I lost another pixel over there, uh, that's not really gonna impact my uh, image. And if I'm actually moving the image in a video, I'm not even gonna notice it. Uh, but what is very critical for us on AB is time synchronization. We need to make sure that the audio, the video are synchronized, and for that UDP uh, gives us a better solution than TCP. Uh, the other thing you guys should be familiar with if you're working with AB over IP, you should know what a VLAN is. It's a way to partition an, a switch into two different or three or four different groups of users that cannot talk to each other without a router. And that allows uh, the system to be more secure, to segregate broadcasts, uh, to better handle the bandwidth, especially of the AB signal. Uh, and if you have members of the VLAN in different switches, they can still talk to each other because there's something called trunking. So you should know about VLANs if you're working here, and also POS. Uh, you may not use POS because it's decided for you by the maker of the equipment you're going to utilize, uh, but at the end of the day, the IT department needs to know that the particular solution that you chose and implemented actually has QoS, because QoS is quality of service. When a frame arrives at a switch or at a router with QoS, it gets preference. And the IT department needs to know that you're gonna give preference to certain things. So essentially QoS works in layer two and layer three. In layer two is called class of service. And in layer three is called the SCP, differential service classes. And uh, as you can see here from a voice over IP phone, uh, going with attack of priority gets converted to a DSCP of priority goes back to attack of priority and gets to the phone on the other side. So be aware of uh, QoS, be ready to tell the IT department that you are using QoS. And finally, uh, the most beautiful thing we have on AB over IP, which is multicast. Uh, unicast is one-to-one, uh, -one. broadcast is one-to-many when we send the message to everybody. A multicast is I'm sending the message only to the people that want to see it. And for that, uh, there's something that you should be familiar with also, which is IGMP and snooping. IGMP is Internet Group Management uh, Protocol, and uh, it's what is used uh, to define the members of the multicast group. So if I have a stream and only 
10% of the people in the company want to watch that stream, that 10% registers to that stream, and IGMP is gonna check around through snooping who wants the stream, and it will send it only to the people that want the stream, and in this way, they're gonna conserve bandwidth. Essentially, uh, only one stream will be sent, so from the point of view of entering the switch, you only have one stream being sent, and then as many streams as are required for members of the multicast group are sent out according to the uh, IGMP snooping. So uh, for that, uh, you're gonna do multicasting, you're gonna need uh, switches that are able to handle IGMP. Okay, so that was very quickly uh, the main points of the AV signal that are relevant and the main one is actually bandwidth and the fact that you want audio and video synchronized. And the second one are the points of the IT uh, network that you should be familiar with to actually talk to IT about your needs. So we agree that we need compression. So uh, there are two types of compression. One is called lossless and the other is lossy or visually lossless. Uh, lossless means that no information is lost. And I'm sorry for all the manufacturers that like to say that they have lossless uh, solutions because the moment that it's lossless uh, is not really AB. Very difficult to do a lossless compression on AB where you need to reduce the signal and not, don't lose any information. That's used mainly for documents like a zip file. It's actually a lossless compression, a real lossless compression. Uh, on AB, we use lossy or visually lossless. Lossy means we can visually see that we lost something, especially on a still image, not so much on a video. And visually lossless is there is no way to distinguish that from the original because of the way that we have done it. Uh, one point I really want you to remember, that's why I put it in red, what you lose is not recoverable. So when you take a file and you compress it and you discard information to make it less heavy on bandwidth to have less bandwidth all that information that is thrown away is lost your decoder will not recreate by some magical means the original signal your decoder will only convert that ethernet package that arrived compressed into a signal that the display uh, can understand uh, here you probably see the difference between a lossy image and a visually lossless image. I'm sorry I didn't have the original here, but it would be uh, almost identical to the visually uh, lossless. Uh, the way they work differently, the visually lossless compresses every frame, so it throws away only uh, what he can throw frame by frame, and that means that it's going to create a file with a higher bandwidth. Uh, the visually, uh, the lossy compression is called inter-frame compression, so it looks at a frame, and if the next frame, the person is still there only moving the hand, then it only encodes the hand, so it loses some detail of what's going on around the person, maybe lighting, maybe shadows, but uh, that's the way that you get a very, very high compression and still a relatively good uh, quality image. Uh, compression codecs, uh, different people make different compression codecs and there's about 100 or 200 companies that make their own proprietary codecs for specific applications, but there are certain groups of standards that create codecs that everybody uses. So uh, IoT and ISO that were separate at the beginning with MPEG and H, nowadays use H.264. Uh, they also develop H.265 and they just release into the market H.266. Uh, each one of them is more efficient than the previous one uh, in terms of reduction of bandwidth and image quality uh, that you can obtain. And uh, essentially, I'm showing here codecs that uh, you will be able to get through the MoxLab products like H.264, H.265. H.266 is not really commercial yet. Uh, then you have JPEG, the Joint Project uh, Photography Experts Group cre created JPEG 2000, which, by the way, is used in the movies. And the JPEG 2000 codec uh, is widely used and uh, on uh, AB, and we can also get MoxLab products with it. And there is a Motion JPEG that was an older uh, way of doing encoding that is also available, very reliable, very inexpensive, but it has its limitations. Uh, then SEMTI uh, has a code for, called the BC2 Dirac Pro, and that is the basis for the SEMTI solutions for broadcast mainly. And then Google uh, had a code called VP9, it's used for all your YouTube videos, and they gave it to the Alliance for Open Media, which has created AV1, and AV1 is gonna be available in boxes uh, this year or beginning of next year, and I'm sure uh, that MoxLab is gonna look at the potential applications of AV1, it seems to be a good uh, codec. So 
MJPEG, uh, it's an intraframe codec. It actually compresses any, every image using JPEG and then puts them together. Is widely used and inexpensive, is not as efficient as H.264, uh, but it is supported by many web browsers and media players, so it is quite popular. Uh, H.264, H.265 is an uh, interframe uh, compression, uh, widely used. It has high latency, but it gives you very low bandwidth. It actually gives you like six, three, four, four, five megabits per second. What you get at home, your television throwing you through the cable is coming with an H.264 uh, compression. H.264 is more new, is better, but people have not yet really adopted it a lot. Uh, JPEG 2000, it's an intra-frame compression, so it can be visually lossless if you do it at the high end of the bandwidth, around 800 megabits per second per stream, but it can also be lossy if you tell it to compress it even more. Uh, they can use jumbo frames, so that's a problem with some routers, and there's another problem with JPEG 2000, there's no standard Ethernet header, so a manufacturer A of JPEG encoder could use a different header than manufacturer B of a decoder, and they could not talk to each other. So if you're using JPEG 2000, use the same manufacturing uh, for encoding and decoding. Uh, Blue River MT, it's a compression that was developed and adopted by SDBOE for the 10 gig solutions, uh, but it's also available, it's proprietary, so you have to buy the chip. Uh, MoxLab has solutions with the Blue River MT uh, compression. It, it has very low latency, sometimes people call it zero latency because it's less than a frame, but doesn't exist zero latency. Anything going through a network and through a switch is going to have some latency as long as it's less than a frame it's called zero. It tends to work with very uh, small compression, 1.4 to one. The whole idea of that chip is to bring a 4K60, 444 below 10 gig. That's the whole idea. Take a pure 4K60, 444 signal or a 4 to zero that it's even easier and just bring it down uh, below 10 gig so we can put it into a 10 gig network. It has its applications, medical, Imaging, excellent application, uh, military intelligence, excellent application, uh, high level architecture, a display wall in a building uh, at the lobby of the company that wants to actually reflect the colors that they are using on their logo. So there are some applications for it. Uh, is it widespread? Uh, not really. 10 gig is an issue and uh, 1 gig works very well in many cases. So. We have a 1 gig Ethernet switch connected with a signal that has any of these compressions or a 10 gig Ethernet switch connected with a signal that has this compression. Uh, what do we want from the switch? We want a switch that is full layer 2 and 3 preferably, so it has routing capabilities. Uh, we want it non-blocking, that means all the ports are able to deliver the full bandwidth of the signal. Uh, we want it able to run IGMP version 2 snooping and queries. Uh, you want to avoid green switches. Uh, some switches turn off when they are not being used. That's pretty bad when you're using audio. Uh, so if you're using Dante or any kind of audio uh, in your AV over IP, uh, when the switch turns itself off and turns itself on, uh, you may have issues with the synchronization of your audio. And also be aware, and that will be a subject for another presentation, that if you're going to use large numbers of sync sources and equipment, you're going to need more than one switch. So you're going to stack switches. And when you stack switches, you need to be very careful. How do you calculate uh, your stack port capabilities, your uplinks? Uh, normally, we recommend that when you use one gig switches, you use 10 gig fiber uplinks uh, in order to be able to send enough bandwidth between switches to transport all the signals that you may want to put in there. If you're using JPEG 2000, for example, at 800 uh, megabit per second, and you put seven encoders, unless you have a 10 gig link, you're not going to leave the switch. You're just going to stay on your local network. And actually, also reliable suppliers uh, of equipment will provide you program switches or they will upload files to program them so that it's easier for you to do the uh, uh, programming. Uh, Netgear has been doing a lot of work in the AV world these days. They're trying to uh, create a niche for them in peep switches for the AV people. Uh, Cisco is more worried about the enterprise. Uh, Loxol also has a nice series of switches. So it's up to you. There's a lot of choices out there. So. We said that uh, you use TCP and UDP to transport signals, but that's only to send the packages and make sure that they arrive or just to send them and make sure they get there quickly. Uh, however, in the upper layers, uh, layers uh, five, six and seven application and presentation, uh, there are protocols that uh, put information on the package that tells the lower layers, listen, this is AB, this has priority. 
So you don't control these protocols, you actually use them because the uh, manufacturer has chosen them, but you should be aware of them. Uh, the most widely used is RTP, uh, real-time protocol, and in the IP packet, it puts a timestamp, obviously. Then you have SEMTI, uh, SEMTI that uses SDI in the broadcast world has now created SEMTI 2110, which essentially separates all the streams, audio, video, and ciliary and time and handles them differently. And that's very good for you. And actually Ames has taken all the SEMTI together with AES 67 on audio and put it together with some pro AV standards like NMOS and MoxLab has a product, the ST2110, that actually implements NMOS, so it's one of the first products in the market uh, doing IPMX. And uh, they are trying to put all these things in there, HDCP, uh, EDIT, uh, Display ID, Hot Plug Detect, uh, cha Channel Mapping, uh, RS-232, USB, things that they don't use in uh, on broadcast, but they want to come up with a standard called IPMX that will be able to fill the needs of both broadcast and pro AV. So keep an eye on the uh, AIMS and the Networker Media Open specifications. Uh, if you're going to stream, you need something different. Uh, normally you stream directly or to a, a CD, CDN, a content delivery network. Uh, in most cases, you're going to do some kind of buffering to make sure that the receiver, that the person that is going to experience the feed uh, is not going to be stuck uh, by stopping and starting, stopping and starting. Uh, the most widely used streaming protocol is HLS. Uh, RTMP is also widely used in the industry. And I think that in most cases, MoxLab uses RTMP uh, for their uh, streaming. And there are three ways that people stream typically. Uh, one of them is adaptive bit rate streaming. That's what Netflix does. Netflix looks at your device and determines your capability to receive a certain bandwidth and adjusts the bandwidth of the signal to your device. Uh, dynamic strip shaping happens at the other end of the transmission where it starts. So the transmitter looks at the internet and depending on the availability of bandwidth on the internet, there is the bandwidth of the stream that they send. And in enterprise, it's very typical to use multi bit rate streaming where you make three copies of anything you're going to stream. You make one a small bandwidth, medium and large bandwidth, and then you send it to devices depending on who's going to consume that stream. If you're going to consume it on mobile devices, you get the low bandwidth. If you're going to consume it on a display, you get the high bandwidth one. So these are things that you should be familiar with if you are streaming. Uh, when it comes to audio, I just want to skip over this because it's a non-standard nightmare. Uh, Dante dominates the market in most of the cases for uh, uh, our world pro AB. Ravenna dominates in the case of uh, broadcast, but uh, the Association of Audio Engineers created AES 67, which is a standard for audio over IP interoperability. If you meet AES 67, that means that uh, products from two different manufacturers can actually talk to each other. And most people are trying to adhere to that standard because it's becoming very popular and SEMTI adopted it also. So how do you deploy an AV over IP network? The best thing to do, an independent network. Uh, if you cannot do that, then VLAN or subnet, an existing network, normally connections to the corporate network for control, or you can try and go into the production network. Uh, what AV knows, AV knows how many sources we have, how many displays, where do we want to put them, the MAC address, uh, if we require IP addresses, uh, if not uh, the ACP with reservations, we know the bandwidth of our signals, and we know the requirements of the switch. What we don't know, is the security of the devices from the IT side. Our devices could have vulnerabilities and they need to look at that. Uh, we don't know the logical topology. We don't know their IP address uh, configuration for multicasting. We may need with the uplink calculations for switch stacking. Uh, we don't know how to set up IGMP. And definitely we don't know firewall configurations and port openings. Uh, we can get the information from the manufacturer which ports have to be open to do a firmware update. And we can tell IT about it and then they'll tell us if they can do it or not. So working through firewalls every time you get out of your LAN or one will require you to work very closely uh, with IT to be successful. Uh, security, I just want to mention it uh, because that could be a four-hour topic. Uh, Avixa has indicated in their security features and best practices that you should segregate the traffic whenever possible and that you should work closely with IT uh, in order to make sure that any equipment that you're plugging into the network meets their uh, security standards. Okay. Uh, 
This is the uh, AB over IP triangle that I mentioned at the beginning and that you're going to be struggling with every time that you do a network video design. And that is the relationship between bandwidth, video quality and latency. Uh, the higher the bandwidth, the higher the video quality, uh, the lower the latency, but the more expensive. Uh, the lower the bandwidth, the higher the latency because it takes time to compress the signal uh, and the video quality is not as good as the other one, but it's cheaper. So uh, if you look at H.264, uh, low bandwidth, high compression, high latency, not nah, so-so quality. If you look at JPEG 2000, good quality, good compression, good bandwidth, good latency. If you look at uh, DSC or HDBST, behaves the same. Blue River, uh, you have very good quality, very high bandwidth, very low latency, very high uh, compression. So that's something that you're always going to be working with. Uh, some examples of how you deploy AV over IP. Uh, in production, for example, an NBA game, uh, you always do an IP core switch structure because you don't going to lose the signal if one of the switches fails. You could go from a native IP camera into your network. Uh, from the network, you can go to a storage area network to keep a file of what you have done. Uh, you can go into the truck for video processing. And then from there, you're going to go through the satellite uh, to the people that are watching uh, the show. Uh, more and more these days through the pandemic, people found out that they could do things remotely. Nowadays, for example, many local or many sports events, uh, you only send a few cameras and a rack uh, to the stadium. Then you ask for a high, uh, uh, let's say you ask for a high speed fiber connection uh, to the switch. And from there, you send it to a studio where you do all your programming. This has been used in Australia, uh, where the distances are enormous. And it has also been used in Europe very uh, successfully. And the extreme of that is an over-the-top uh, transmission bypassing the set-top box where you can have cameras in Paris and you can have the director in the Cayman Island, Islands. Uh, you can have special effects in Toronto, replay in Singapore, advertisers in Tel Aviv, and everybody is connecting with the stream that it's in the cloud and interacting with it. So uh, the director of Fox Sports indicated that many things have changed with the pandemic and that a lot of the things are never go back to the way they were in terms of broadcast. Uh, a typical AV over IP arrangement, and this is a mock slab uh, slide, uh, is what you're going to have. And it can be as simple as a doctor's office with two sources or three and three or four displays uh, to a casino with uh, 20 sources and 2,000 displays to an airport with uh, 40 sources and 4,000 displays. In every case, you're going to have sources. The sources are going to go into a encoder uh, box that is going to compress the signal and put it into uh, Ethernet packages. Then it's going to go into a switch. And from there, it's going to go through a connection of switches, 100 meters each, uh, into the decoders and from there to the displays. Uh, typically, you can also put the signal on a router to make it accessible in a wireless way. And you could also put a network controller or a PC running a program connecting to the switch. That is the one that allows you to do all the drag and drop and plan your system. Uh, finally, if you're streaming, uh, like an overflow room in a, in a campus, uh, you may have a lecture just with a camera and a microphone. You can encode that signal put it on the LAN and send it to an overflow room. And if you want to do stream first, you have to bypass the firewall or go through the firewall, work with IT on that. And once you put it there, you'll do it into a content delivery network uh, that is going to send it to whoever wants to watch it on demand or live with a certain buffer to make sure that the experience is good enough. Okay, so uh, we got all these options. We got all these possibilities. How are you going to choose? Well, uh, we should look at the possibilities. Uh, we should imagine the ability to access and control systems from anywhere. Uh, the level of controls that we have are incredible. All our solutions can work seamlessly and flawlessly, and, and we can achieve our vision by using one of our uh, Mox Labs uh, solutions. It doesn't matter what your vertical is. If you're doing a home theater or you're doing a classroom or digital signage, ballroom systems, security, sports bars, medical imaging, broadcast, all of these are solutions that are available and uh, they are flexible, they are expandable, they are convenient, they are cost effective. This is what I told you at the beginning, a remote management, easy to install. We know how to install networks, uh, video wall support, low latency if you want it. It's going to be more expensive, but you can have it. Uh, Multi-viewer, digital signage, all these things are available uh, with AV over IP with the solutions that we're going to present. And uh, MoxLab has developed an app, MoxLab Control, uh, that also allows you to do all your controls now with an app. So uh, from that point of view, it, it's pretty amazing. 
uh, that you can go out and actually control your whole system uh, through an app uh, on your phone on an iPad. So uh, very quickly, uh, if you look at the uh, product line for AV over IP, what you see here is a progression uh, from an entry level to 4K60 on compress, okay, which would be the highest possible level that you're going to do. So at an entry level, you're gonna use motion JPEG uh, uh, compression. At the middle level, you're gonna use an H.264, H.265, or maybe a JPEG uh, 2000 compression. And then once you get to the highest level, you're gonna do Blue River NT, or you're gonna do it on compress, because it can be done also if you use certain technologies. Uh, in each case, you're gonna have a certain latency uh, that it can go from 80 uh, uh, megabytes per second to six to 200 milliseconds to one frame to zero latency. Uh, the uh, compression, I love this part of uh, MoxLab that they actually use the word visually lossless uh, correct, cor correctly in this case and lossless when there is no uh, compression. And you can do IR and PoE, you can do RS-232, uh, you can do video walls. So by looking at this type of chart, uh, you get an idea of all the solutions that are available to you. Uh, you can also get them in a wall plate format. You can do KVM. You can do audio. And for audio, we're probably going to be doing a Dante, I assume. And uh, MoxLab has worked for a long time with the broadcast industry. So a lot of the products are also based on SDI, which is the standard connector uh, that is used in the uh, broadcast industry. And the last thing that I want to do is I would like uh, just to show you that uh, this class uh, pretends also to be uh, to allow you to read a data sheet. Okay, when you receive a data sheet from a manufacturer for an AP over IP system, and this is an example from MoxLab, uh, unless uh, you have listened to this webinar or unless you had previous knowledge uh, in depth on AV or IT, uh, there are things in there that you may not have understood. And I hope that right now everybody would understand that. So it supports 4K60 444. We know what 444 means now, it's uncompressed. Uh, it supports 1080p at 1060 and upscales to 4K60. It uses the H.264, H.265 video codec. Uh, it does uh, multicast in the LAN, so it allows you to multicast and uses RTSP, RTMP, and HLS uh, for the LAN and internet uh, transport. Okay, so uh, this is uh, what I was also, or what I hope for is that after learning all these basic components of AV over IP, you actually can better understand the products that the manufacturers are offering you. Uh, so how do you really implement it? This is the end. Uh, well, you should educate yourself and that's what we're doing today. We're working together at trying to learn more about something that is important uh, for us. Uh, you should cut through the noise, okay? And for that, I mean uh, what the marketing people are gonna tell you, I don't care who tells you, uh, there's always a little bit of noise about every solution. So you should be able to understand the technology well enough that you can cut through it and determine, uh, does it fit my application? Because at the end of the day, it's all about the application is what the user uh, needs. And the MoxLab team is very focused on making sure that they focus on the application. And remember, it's a team effort uh, for AB and IT professionals. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for listening to this. Uh, and uh, I'll entertain any questions now. And I'll also leave on the screen my contact information in case anybody has a question that I can answer. And anything related more to the solutions of MoxLab, then please contact the sales team at moxlab.com or your sales team rep that, that you are familiar uh, with. Thank you. Thanks, Jose. Hi, everyone. This is Lori. I'm the marketing director at MuxLab. Um, Jose, I just want to let you know in the questions, we also have just a lot of thank you, thank you. This was great. Thank you. So um, I think everyone appreciated this a lot. There was one question that came in earlier. I don't believe it was addressed. Yeah, I see it, was, it here. The yeah, one, why I, need VPN, why I need VPN if I have IGMP. Yep. Ah, uh, okay. I don't know if we're mixing uh, acronyms here. Maybe Marco can provide a little bit more detail because a VPN uh, is essentially a virtual private network. Uh, so all VPN does, it allows you from home to establish a secure tunnel uh, to your network in the uh, enterprise and to communicate with your network. 
uh, that has nothing to do uh, with IGMP. IGMP is strictly focused on, I have a source, for example, uh, at a sports bar, okay? And I wanna send it to only uh, four of the displays on the sports bar. So I use internet group management protocol to set up a multicast where that source goes only to those four displays. Okay, so uh, one thing has nothing to do with the other. And if instead of VPN, you were referring to VLAN, again, those things are two things completely different. VLAN will just define a series of users that are like on a separate network almost, and they can only communicate with each other. When you send the broadcast, it only goes to these users. But if you were to send uh, an AB stream broadcast, and some people don't want to watch it, then you'll be wasting uh, bandwidth. That's why we have multicast because the stream only goes to the users that want to see it and you don't waste any bandwidth in that way. Uh, if you want to open the, uh, the, the microphones and anybody wants to ask a question, I'll be glad to try and answer it. Uh, hello. Yes. I, I typed a message, but I'm going to ask you. So if, if somebody has an installation and they already have a switch, they don't have IGMP, can they just create VLANs for the video over IP? Uh, well, uh, let's start there. Uh, if they have an installation and they don't have IGMP, they may have a non-managed switch. And if they have a non-managed switch, then definitely they cannot create VLANs. You need a managed switch. Once you have a managed switch, it will be very rare uh, that they don't have the capability to run IGMP. Uh, but at the end of the day, the answer is no. Uh, VLANs and IGMP uh, are two completely different things. Let's imagine an enterprise, okay? And uh, there's a group of human resources. Uh, I create a VLAN and the people of human resources belong to that VLAN because they share a server, they share information, they share files for confidentiality. When one of them wants to send information to somebody else in that group, he can do it through the switch uh, if he wants to send information to somebody in another VLAN, he has to go through the router. But any broadcast on that VLAN, any message that says we're going to shut down or we're going to go to drink at three o'clock, will go to everybody in the VLAN. So just by having a VLAN doesn't mean that you have multicasting. Okay, multicasting means uh, I want to invite only four people in human resources to have a drink. So I'm, I'm going to multicast only to those four people. Uh, in order for them to know that we're having a drink, but I don't want the rest of the people to know uh, that we're having a drink. Uh, on IP, on AV, what we do is we try to limit the streams to only the people that want to watch them. Otherwise, we have a huge broadcast storm, uh, we have a huge bandwidth storm, and we may run out of bandwidth in our system. So VLANs, IGMP, two completely different things. Uh, what are some of the common issues you come across with AB over IP? Oh my God. <laughs> some of the common issues. Uh, well, I'll tell you my, my pet peewee because one of my customers in, uh, in Edmonton, it was not a MoxLab customer, fortunately, uh, had it. And that is he bought a system and the manufacturer did not have automatic discovery and control. So what I mean by that is you want to buy a solution that when you plug it into the switch and you turn everything on, uh, all the boxes talk to each other and immediately you see in your control screen all your sources, all your displays, and you can start playing with drag and drop. If you don't have that, and there are solutions out there that are cheap that don't have that, then you're going to have to enter every one of the sources and every one of the streams into this place, I'm sorry, into your control uh, program, one by one, MAC address, IP address by one, and that's gonna be a real pain. It took my customers in that university three days to do the work. So uh, discovery and control to me, it's a very, very uh, important thing. Uh, another one of the problems that I found is uh, really the uh, uplink uh, calculation between switches. Uh, so people will put a one gigabit of link between two one gigabit switches and once they start trying to send more streams out, uh, it's never going to happen. It, it's not going to happen because the one gigabit of link cannot handle it. Uh, remember, if I put 12 sources uh, of one gig each, I actually have 12 gigs going into the switch. And if the switch is non-blocking, I have the opportunity to put 10 gigs, 12 gigs out, 12 megabits out, 
uh, on the uh, on each one of the output ports to this place, for example. But if I want to send them to another switch, I need an uplink that can handle all that bandwidth. So a switch uplinks is a problem. And if you're doing IGMP, uh, there's an added problem. There's always a, a switch that is called the querier. You have to select the switch that checks that everybody it's a member of the group and that switch handles all the streams that are going on so it needs an uplink that it's even bigger so that's another problem and the last one i'll mention uh, would be poe uh, most devices nowadays are poe capable but you have to make sure that your switch that you bought has enough budget uh, to handle the poe requirement of all the devices that you're going to connect with uh, how do you control the routing via a third-party uh, device? Uh, I'm guessing what you're talking here is a third-party routers on the internet. Uh, well, uh, that's what the internet does. Uh, you send a message to an NIP address, it gets to your switch, the switch finds out it's not in your network, it sends it to a router. Uh, the router realizes uh, that it has a routing table that tells it where that IP address, it may be in New York, and it starts moving it through routers to go all the way down uh, to, uh, to New York. And it's gonna have latency, but it is going to happen. However, if the, the stream is JPEG 2000, maybe a router on the way is gonna drop it. Uh, that's a problem. And the other thing also is that not all the routers handle multicasting, so that's why there is no multicasting on the internet. Okay, multicasting is limited to the LAN or your own one where you control the whole routing system in the in the uh, network. You have control of all the routers and you can guarantee that all of them uh, can handle uh, multicasting. Otherwise, there is no multicasting on the internet. Uh, this webinar right now is not being multicasted. Everybody that is uh, in this uh, webinar listening is a unicast uh, that is going from one feed coming from me and then it is being created by the company that is uh, facilitating this uh, webinar and creating enough streams for each one of you guys. There is no multicasting on the internet. All right, so Jose, I think our time is up. If anyone has any further questions at any time, um, you can see our contact info on the screen right now. We'd be happy to address these questions further for you. And um, for those of you who have asked, yes, the presentation will be recorded and sent to anyone who attended um, the webinar today. So that will come to you probably um, either tomorrow or by Monday at the latest. So that's something that you'll be able to have. I know some of you said that it was fantastic, but a lot of information. So you'll be able to go over it, um, you know, at your own pace uh, with the recording. Yeah, I, I, I apologize and I said it at the beginning uh, because, you know, this, this presentation has a lot of information uh, and I've been doing it now for over two years now and I've been trying to cut down, cut down when I try to do it only in one hour. But uh, you, I either mention everything that is relevant and give you just the word and then you can go and research it or I don't, I don't mention things that are important and that's, uh, that's the best that I could do to put everything together. So thank you so much, Jose. Thank you for everyone who came on today. And uh, like I said, you'll be getting the recording uh, by Monday at the latest. Okay, thank you everybody. Thank you uh, everyone, bye. have a good evening. Hasta la vista.